inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. Today on the podcast, we've got a sad story with a happy ending. Joining us on the show from Alabama is Felicia Corker. Felicia's husband died, and she had to figure out a way to generate income to support her family. And she figured out that rental properties could do that. She figured out how to buy a rental property. She figured out how to make money off of it. And today she's supporting her family off the rental properties. I think it's a great story. I think you're going to get a lot out of today's episode. So let's take a real quick break. We'll come back in 30 seconds and we'll meet Felicia. Are you looking for a roadmap to financial freedom? If so, we have a solution for you. Narada Real Estate is offering a limited number of free strategy sessions to help you get out of the rat race. Learn how you can create wealth and build monthly passive income. To set up a time with one of our knowledgeable investment counselors, simply go to naradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. Felicia, welcome to the podcast. So real estate wasn't something you had dreamed of. You kind of fell into it. Why don't you take us back and tell us what happened? Okay. Well, in the fall of 2012, my husband became very ill and he passed away uh, early in 2013. And we had been married for 29 years, five children, four oldest are in their 20s, married, a couple of grandchildren. And then we had had a a 10-year gap between the fourth and the fifth. So I had an eight-year-old at the time. And all of a sudden, you know, Dan, I sat there and and just looked at my situation. I had a, a nice sum of money from an insurance policy, but I did the quick math in my head and realized that to continue homeschooling my daughter, which we had always homeschooled, and to maintain a similar lifestyle to what we had had, that money would be gone in five or six years. And that to put it in the bank was the same as losing three to 4% a year with just standard inflation. So I knew I needed cash flow and I knew I wanted it to be passive so that I could be with my daughter. I had no real estate experience, but I had a little bit of a background in watching my parents who had a mobile home park with rental units as well as spaces and a couple of houses. So that was a large endeavor for them that they'd had for about five or six years when I was a teenager. I had a market in mind when I thought about a rental property. To well, my boys. let me let me stop you right there for a second. First of all, I'm I'm really sorry about your husband. That that is just horrible. But out of all of the investment choices that you have with with the money, like why did you go with real estate? I, I I get that your parents, you had been exposed to it through your parents, but out of all the millions of investment choices out there, why did you pick real estate? Well, I knew nothing about the stock market. I have a little bit of stock now, but I knew nothing about it. That seemed scary. It seemed it seemed scary to put enough into that to make anything. Mm-hmm. I just, I, to me, it just seemed a natural way of having cash flow. I right. didn't know of anything else to do, I guess. So, and you it, weren't it wasn't through any experience. You I weren't had. scared off because I feel like people that aren't in this business will will tell you that tenants aren't going to pay; they're going to trash the property. Like none of those myths like scared you off guys. I'm sure you've heard all that or thought of all that. I heard all that. I heard a lot of it from my own parents because they had, they were immersed in, you know, in totally taking care of things themselves. My father worked a a full-time manual labor job. And when the call came that there was a sewage line had burst up under the trailer, it was he wading through it at 2 AM in the boots. And they had a lot of oil field workers that would come through and, and not very clean inside the trailers. And my mom did all that. So I knew all the bad. That's probably why I went with the type of uh, setup that I did for my first purchases as I, I went with a duplex uh, property in a college town where my boys had attended college. And I went with a property manager that I had heard great things about, and he's every bit as good as what I heard. And so I had a, a nice st- hands-off start. Awesome. Into investment. That's the way to do it. So, so tell me about that first deal. So, how did you find that first property? I found Kurt Haley, and I'll give him a plug because he and his people, a Haley Management Company in Auburn and Opelika, do a great job. 
the the woman who owned the unit where my boys lived, I made contact with her and I said, how do you do this? What, I mean, you know, I was I was just a sponge. I wanted, how, how does this work for you? Do you make money? So she had had a positive experience with him and, and we connected. We had lunch. He showed me a couple of other properties, but I ended up purchasing in the same complex where my boys had lived. I knew how the units looked inside. They are 3-3 on each side and a low maintenance type exterior. And, um, you know, paid 150 cash for those. Each side pulls about 950 or to 1,000. And, um, you know, so minus his fees and some other expenses, it's a pretty good return. Yeah, on, that's on that. great. And now with a college rental, there's always the risk that you're going to have college kids having parties or that they're not going to pay you. Did you have any of those problems? Well, it's good that I'm away. <laughs> uh, I'm, it's good that I'm a distance away. If if there's ever a hole in the sheetrock or a screen that got uh, bent up because somebody had to let themselves in the wrong way, I don't know about it. All I might see is screen replaced, forty dollars, you know, on mm-hmm. my on my itemized. So while I'm while I might see some expenses on there that maybe was due to some of what you just described, yeah. not having to have my eyes on the situation. That would kind of probably freak me yeah. out a little bit if I had to walk around the property all the time. But I think it's in in very good shape, and, and you know, Kurt makes sure it stays that yeah. way. So that's great. Yeah, I, I think that it's it, it's I think it's better to have a property manager. Uh, I, I guess everyone's different, but but I, I think for you at at that point, getting started and not knowing really what you were doing, having a property manager that's going to take care of everything and just deposit you your rent money every month oh, i think like it was magic, a good move you know? and yeah 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 being getting started and being at a distance and we you know I, we might talk about in just in a, in a little bit about that i do have a different situation here locally but that situation oh yes i would not attempt that without a good property manager now take me back to to right after you bought that place so i mean you, you you're you're looking for cash flow because i mean your husband had just passed away did did that duplex give you the cash flow that you were looking for? Yes, uh, like I said, you know, some that first unit, and then I, I bought another uh, duplex. So I have four doors there in Auburn now, and they each it's in the same. Both of them are in the same place, and they rent for around nine nine fifty. So I would say that my uh, my rate of return there is ten or eleven percent, and the cash flow each month from those four properties is anywhere from. 3400 to maybe down to to 28 or so depending on whether they're going to take taxes out that time or it's a turnaround month or you know maybe a, a water heater went out and that was 800 off one month but those you know I'm averaging now I'm going to say 3000 average okay that's that's beautiful that that's that's really good now when you bought the second place did you buy it from the same people or like how did you find the second property well, I, I turned to Kurt again, and honestly, I can't remember if it's his. He has a real estate agency now, or I know he is a real estate agent, but uh, I know uh, he was my contact. By that time, I had to pay a little more. There, it was one seventy, so I did finance half of that. So I still have a, and I'm down to about owing only about sixty five on that. So I, I have great equity in all those properties. And uh, they've appreciated a good bit. Right in, in kind of preparation for the show, I, I went on and did some searching. First of all, you can't find any really for sale. But um, the best I could come is that they would sell anywhere from 2 to 220 each. And I paid 150 and 173 oh, years ago. Coming up on the Rental Income Podcast. The next two properties that Felicia bought were short-term rentals. So I want to see how that's worked out in comparison to her other properties. We'll get into all that and go over the numbers here in just a moment. First, I want to welcome a brand new sponsor to the podcast. It's Roofstock. If you're looking for good cash flowing rental properties, you know the market is really competitive right now, and it's very difficult to find properties where the numbers make sense. Well, luckily, Roofstock has solved that problem. They have a new hassle free way that you can buy cash flowing rental properties all across the country. What they do is they list tenant-occupied rental homes, and they also connect their customers with local property managers in each market. 
Roofstock does all the number crunching so you can log on their website, you can see pictures, and you can make investment decisions based on the cap rate, the returns, the monthly cash flows, and you're not limited by where you live. Roofstock has a special offer just for our listeners. If you go to roofstock.com slash rental income and sign up today, you can get $350 off when you close on your first rental property through Roofstock. Offer valid for a limited time only. Terms and conditions apply. Go to roofstock.com slash rental income for $350 off when you close on your first rental property. That's roofstock.com slash rental income. All right, let's get back to the show. So Felicia, tell me about the vacation rentals. Okay. I have two side-by-side small studio apartments. They're about 440 square feet each. Uh, we, I live on Mobile Bay. I, I live a little bit off the bay. The property, the, the complex where these properties are is on a bluff overlooking the bay. So I have a prime spot for these little two. That's why I bought the second one. When I saw the for sale sign come up on the door of the second one, about a year after the first one, I knew I wanted to snap it up because my little back decks overlook a common area that overlooks a bluff. So they can sit on their deck each afternoon and have their glass of wine and watch the most gorgeous sunsets. So uh, those I pretty much gutted, one about 70%, one about 90%. Redid those like a very nice hotel room. They're about the size of a double hotel room. If you just take out that first queen bed and replace it with a kitchen, you kind of have the idea of the floor plan. And um, and just had fun decorating them. Uh, you know, just loved that whole process and got those listed on some online sites like Airbnb, VRBO, TripAdvisor. So those those do well. And I do all the work myself on those two studios. Is it a lot of work, like doing the cleanings and the bookings and everything that goes into it? It is. I would say I would say I put in, you know, some months it's not much because like right now, my guests in both units are snowbirds. This time of the year, we have people come down from the north to escape the cold weather. So I literally, they take care of themselves for the month or two or three almost. Okay. Other months, I might have four and five day turnarounds in both units. And all I feel like I'm doing is cleaning. Right. You know, so it just, it averages out in the end, I'd say to, to six or seven hours of, of work per week. And that's an average. But the returns are probably ridiculous compared to what you would get if those were a rental, right? Absolutely. I, I just sat down to get my income tax information ready and my, my gross cash flow from those two little units for 2017 was like $38,000. Now that's gross. Wow. Um, Incredible. I don't have to figure my net. I would say my net cash, my net return on those is somewhere around 17 to 20%. Now, if they were a regular rental, how much do you think you would be making off each unit? Or I guess for, for what would your gross be if they were just a regular plain Jane rental? Well, not much. I can tell you that the ones are there. I'm the only person in the complex that I know that's doing this. There are owners and there are, there are renters there, but, um, but the little studios only rent for between six and 700 a month. And one of the reasons I got involved with the HOA there is of course I have a vested interest in seeing things get better and better, but it, it, I will be honest with you. It's tough there for several reasons. The exterior's older. They were built in 1973 and a kind of interesting story about that. They were built across Mobile Bay, unit by unit by Vietnam vets at Blakely Field. They used the Blakely Field is closed down now, but during World War One and Two, ships were built there. And they were barged across unit by unit and put in place. They've survived a couple of hurricanes and all that, but they definitely it's hard to maintain the exterior of those. For that reason, the HOA fees are high there. For the four hundred and forty square feet, I pay a hundred and twenty eight a, a month for each unit. Um, you know, and, and all the exterior is, um, is taken care of, but it's a job. So for somebody, so I say that to answer your question, if I were only getting $600 a month after insurance taxes and yeah. HOA fees, you wouldn't make any money. I think it would be hard to pull a yeah. hundred to a month even. Yeah. I mean, you would probably be losing money, you know, after yeah. you have some repairs in there and some vacancy, like, I, I don't see how you could make that work, but it seems as a short term rental, you've hit the jackpot uh, on those two houses. That's, that's I, awesome. I think so. I think it's, it's um, we are a coastal town. So when you get down 50 miles away to Gulf Shores and the beaches, 
you know, property, uh, vacation property goes way, way up. So I fit a little need for people who, well, for several, I have other than vacationers. I have corporate and I have people looking for homes or they've bought a home and they don't close for two weeks, but they need to move down here. You know, all I've had a honeymooners, you know, you name it, but, um, but I can charge a lot less than, and they can make a day trip to the beach, let's say, Mm -hmm. or whatever. You now, know. you mentioned that you're doing Airbnb, VRBO, and I think you said one more. That trip one, Advisor. Trip Advisor. Is there a difference between the clientele that, that you get off the different sites, or is there, are they all pretty much the same? No, I have noticed a difference, and I think it was due to the original nature of the difference in the sites, where Airbnb and Trip Advisor were never um, rent by owner in terms of... Um, you know, you doing your own contracts and, you know, communicating with guests and all that. So I think the guests that I get from there, they, they don't expect a whole lot of back and forth communication. They're, they, they trust the system, I guess you'd say, and, and depend on that system. The VRBO where it started out is just the owner paying an annual subscription and doing all of the rentals personally with their guests you know, there's there tends to be a lot more messaging back and forth and all that. That's that's changing. The RBO is changing their setup. I think, unfortunately, so some others may disagree and prefer to have everything handled. I loved talking with my guests right up front, sending a contract via email, um, you know, just handling that. And mm-hmm. I, maybe because I was never burned, I hadn't had a bad experience, you know, but um but I'm going to miss that. But VRBO yeah. is moving away from that. But I tend, I get older people from VRBO. And like I say, they like to communicate with me, tell me more of their stories up front, things like that. Yeah. Okay. And now you're continuing to buy some more properties. And so you've got two other properties that you have under contract right now? One I own. I've owned okay. since November. Okay. Uh, the carrying costs are killing me on that, but it's my own fault. I'm choosing to do a lot of the work myself. And I... um. I think it's worth something that I'm learning so much. You know, I took down painted popcorn ceilings myself. I can, I, I'm, I'm an expert with a caulking gun now. And, you know, that kind of thing. I, I count all that toward for something. But I'm hoping to have that one in operation in about three weeks. As another short-term rental, this will, I'll be venturing into larger territory because this one's 1,378 square feet. I'll be getting, you know, maybe families where I don't have room for families and the others. I don't know. Um, you know, you'll have to, I'll have to get back with you on how that goes. The other property I'm going to close on this month, it has a tenant and it will be my first foray into traditional 12 month leases, managing myself, local, that kind of thing. Okay. And do you know, um, how the tenant is like, are, is the tenant, are they paying? Um, they, do you know what you're walking into? Yes, I did. I, I did make sure that, uh, that she, first of all, wants to stay. And right now she does. I did ask that our agent speak with the seller, the selling agent, you know, give me information about payment, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's all new territory to me in terms of how we turn that lease over. These are things I'd love to hear some of your guests talk about in the future. You know, the, the details about transferring a lease from one to the other, how you sit down with a tenant and say, now this was not expected of you from the old lease. You know, I'd, I'd like it to work this way. Uh, security yeah. deposits and, and property managers that might have contracts out, all those kind of right. things are going to be. Yeah. Now. I mean, I, I think you're asking the right questions, which, which makes me think you're, you're going to be okay with this, but yeah, that that's <laughs> one thing that I would, um, do is make sure at closing you get the security deposit. Like, don't forget that because right. once that closing has happened, the odds of you getting it are probably pretty slim. I, I would also recommend doing a new lease because you don't know what the terms are of the lease or if that landlord had a had a good lease. So I, I would I would have your own lease. That's that, what I. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a copy of theirs and then work up changes on it and have a sign. A new lease, and I am going to let her go month to month, just because then, if you know, for my own benefit as well. Yeah, if like you don't that. like her, you can get rid of her. I mean, you give yeah, her thirty yeah, days yeah, notice, exactly. and and so. yeah, that sounds that sounds good. And and then with the other property, why are you choosing to do the um, short term rentals again with that one? Is it just that the return is so much greater? 
Yes, and it's kind of a silly reason. It's a, it, one of the reasons is it was hard to resist, and I knew the place had such potential for a renovation to be just absolutely awesome, and I knew that I could do it for a little bit, you know, cheaper just because of the things I wanted to do. So it was a, it was a little experiment for me into some interior design and stuff like that. So just, just kind of having fun with it. And I think that I can, I think I can get enough of a return to at least for a couple, three years, if I decide that I, I want to get out of that to make yeah. my money back, my furnishings and things like that. Well, uh, Felicia, you know, and, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I think, you know, I, I think this you, you've taken a bad situation and you've really made the most of it. And I, I, I really think your husband would be very proud of you. It, it seems like you, you've built a great business by just putting in some some work and 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 doing all the right things. So congratulations. Thank you. I think he would be, too. And that makes me feel good. And it, it it's a motivating factor for me to continue. Thank you very much. Oh, of course. If you want to connect with Felicia, I've got a link to her Facebook page. You can find it at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 147. Thank you so much for subscribing to the podcast. We've got new interviews every single Tuesday. My name is Dan Lane, and we'll talk to you next Tuesday on the Rental Income Podcast.